Welcome to Chapter 14, AMSCO U.S. History, The Civil War from 1861 to 1865. As always, please make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and share this with your friends so they can enjoy these videos too. Thanks! So, the Civil War was the most costly of all American wars in terms of loss of human life, and it was also the most destructive war ever fought in the Western Hemisphere. But in the end, it freed 4 million people from slavery, and also changed American society by accelerating industrialization and modernizing the North. But it also destroyed much of the South. So it all began at Fort Sumter. So basically, Fort Sumter was this Union fort located in Charleston, South Carolina, so by this time, the South has seceded with President Lincoln taking office. And there were two federal forts, and Fort Sumter was one of them. So in this harbor, the South really wanted to cut off vital supplies and reinforcements that the North, or the Union, was bringing in. So Lincoln didn't want to give up this fort, so he decided to just send food to the small holding. And what happened was he gave South Carolina the choice to either permit the fort to hold out or open fire onto it. And sure enough, on April 12, 1861, the war began when Carolina started to fire into it. But at the end of only two days, South Carolina had gotten it for the Confederacy, and that basically started the Civil War. So an important date is to know that the Civil War began in 1861. So right when this war, war started, Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus in Maryland and other states with strong pro-Confederate sentiment. So basically what this was, it was a constitutional right that people could not be arrested without being informed of the charges against them. Well, Lincoln suspended this so people can now be arrested and not be told the charges against them. And during the war, a lot of people, like tens of thousands, were arrested on suspicion of aiding the enemy. So this soon after the war led to a big debate about the constitutionality of it. Lincoln did this through executive order because at the time Congress was not in session and he felt this was a critical thing that needed to be done. Also at this time, the Union people decided to come up with a strategy, and it was created by General-in-Chief Winfield Scott. You may remember him from the War of 1812 and also the Mexican Wars. And basically, he devised this three-part strategy, and one of them was the Anaconda Plan. This was basically using the U.S. Navy to blockade southern ports, and it basically hoped to cut off essential supplies from reaching the Confederacy and making the South surrender. So you can see, it's kind of like this Anaconda Snake, all the way from Virginia wrapping around to the Gulf, all the way like to Missouri. So this was basically the plan. So after General Robert E. Lee won the first and second battles of Bull Run, he decided to lead his army across the Potomac River into enemy territory in Maryland because he hoped that this would convince Britain and other countries to give official recognition and support to the Confederacy, which was basically just seen as a group of rebels back then. So basically, unfortunately for him, someone had taken advantage and known his battle plan because a copy of it had been dropped by a Confederate officer. So the Union Army somehow got it, and they decided to intercept the Confederates at Antietam Creek in Maryland. So this is the town of Sharpsburg. And basically what was significant was this was the bloodiest single day of combat in the entire war. And it took place where like 22,000 people, soldiers, were killed or wounded. But Lee could not break Union lines in the end and had to retreat back to Virginia. Well, Lincoln really wanted the Union general, McClellan, to invade and destroy Lee at the time. But he didn't really want to, so he got fired. And Lincoln really said like he this McClellan dude had a bad case of slows, and this was ultimately bad because it ended in a draw on the battlefield. So even though the Confederates couldn't get the support from outside people they needed, the Union people couldn't really get a big triumph, although later they might use it to help them with their plans. The Trent Affair. So in late 1861, Britain came really close to siding with the Confederacy. Basically, two diplomats from the Confederacy, James Mason and John Slidell, were traveling to England on a British steamer, the Trent, and basically they wanted to gain recognition for the government. So a Union warship stopped the British ship and removed these two and brought them to the United States, of course, as prisoners of war. But Britain really didn't like this and threatened America with war over the incident until these two were, were released. And Lincoln really didn't like this, but he decided to give in, and these two were set free, and then they went to sail to Europe again. But ultimately, they couldn't obtain full recognition of the Confederacy from either Britain or France. So the South really wanted this, but ultimately never got it. So early in the war, Union generals sometimes refused to return captured slaves to their Confederate owners, and basically they were arguing that like this was contraband of war. And so this power to seize enemy property really came to be a strong point of the Union. So that was also the legal basis for the first Confiscation Act passed in August of 1861 by Congress. So 1861, so this is really early in the war. And basically soon after the passage of this act, many of these people decided to run away, these slaves, and they ran into Union camps where they were obviously free. And in 1862, Congress passed another one, and in this one, it basically said that freed persons enslaved by anyone engaged in rebellion against the United States, the Confederacy basically, were allowed to be free. And it basically allowed the president to use free slaves 
as people in the army eventually later in later battles. So one of these was the Massachusetts 54th Regiment, and this was a segregated all-black unit. And these troops performed courageously under fire and won the respect of the traditional Union white soldiers. And at the end, these people really helped to secure victory for the North. So with the Republican Party really dominating in the Union, they decided to take advantage of their position and stimulate some major economic growth. And they also had these ambitious economic programs. So one of them was the Homestead Act of 1862. And this basically promoted settlement of the Great Plains by offering parcels of 160 acres of public land free to any person or family that farmed that land for at least five years. So basically they're saying, yo, if you come to this land, we'll give you free land. I wish they had that today. Also, there was the Morrill Land Grant Act, and this was also in the year 1862. And in this, it basically encouraged states to use the sale of federal land grants to maintain agricultural and technical colleges. So as you may remember, back in the day, colleges such as Harvard were founded by institutions like churches. But now the federal government was encouraging states to maintain these colleges as well. With the war raging on, Lincoln really started to see slavery become more of an issue and decided that all enslaved people really needed to be free within the United States. So he thought of this in around July 1862, but didn't really have the time but eventually he justified it as a military necessity and had a delayed announcement. But at the same time, he was like also encouraging the border states at the time to come up with plans for emancipation just as he was going to do, but of course with compensation for the landowners. So after the Battle of Antietam, as we saw earlier, Lincoln issued a warning that enslaved people in all states still in rebellion on January 1st, 1863, would be then, thenceforth, and forever free. And that's quoted by Lincoln. So by New Year's Day, 1863, all people in the United States were free. And he said this, but it didn't really have a big consequence at first because it only applied to enslaved people residing in Confederate states outside of Union control, and the Union didn't control much, so the border states still allowed to continue this enslavement. But for the first time, Union armies were fighting against slavery well, and it wasn't only for secession purposes. So with each advance of the Northern troops, abolition basically grew as well. And by the end, the Union soldiers had even used free slaves, as we saw earlier, to try to win this war. Although perhaps not as significant then, it is so significant now as the first step to abolition. Next is the Legal Tender Act. So basically, the North was really starting to run out of some money, and so they passed this act in 1862 to finance the Civil War. It basically allowed the federal government for the first time to print paper money, they were called greenbacks, but they weren't backed by an equal amount of gold or silver. So by the end of the war, there was tons of inflation, and this was really hard for the people in the North. And this really contributed to prices like in the North rising by rising by about 80% and other issues that were plaguing the North economically. Along with this, so the North was trying to manage the new revenue in and out of the treasury, so they created another national bank system in 1863. This was the National Banking Act, and it was basically the first unified banking network since, as you may remember, Andrew Jackson vetoing the recharter of the Bank of the United States in the 1830s versus that Biddle guy. The Civil War might have been great for slaves, but it also helped a lot of women out as well. So that was just one of the many social changes. So for example, they stepped into the labor vacuum, and one of these labor vacuums was military nurses and volunteers. So many times, these people played a critical role, these women, in helping soldiers aid societies. And they would really, many times, just help these soldiers out if they got injured or other stuff that women were really great at doing at the time, and still are today. So when the war ended, many of them returned home, and women returned to their old jobs. But eventually, this helped them as well. But one of these very important nurses was Clara Barton, who is very notable in U.S. history because she was a pioneering nurse in the Civil War. And nursing education was not very formalized at the time, and she didn't attend nursing school. But she self-taught herself and eventually saved a lot of Union soldiers' lives. When the war began in 1861, you may remember that most of those fighters were actually volunteers, but as the war dragged on, replacements were really needed. So the Confederacy itself had laws for conscripting or drafting men, and the Union did as well. Most notable for the Union was the Conscription Act in March 1863, so this was sort of near the end of the war. And it basically said that like all men between ages 20 and 45 liable were liable for military service, but they could get out of this draft for free. Well, not free, by either finding a substitute for them or paying a $300 fee. So this law, of course, provoked fierce opposition among the poor people who didn't have that $300 and didn't really want to fight. And this was also sort of like the start of the drafting system in the United States. And the biggest fear for them was that if they fought and returned to civilian life, the free slaves would take their jobs. But And eventually, in 1863, riots against the draft actually broke out in New York City, the New York City draft riots. 
And basically, it was a mostly Irish American mob. They attacked the blacks and wealthy whites who really supported this. And some 117 people were killed before federal troops finally came in and suspended it to restore order. So the war wasn't always popular in the Union or the North, and there were certain people like Peace Democrats and Copperheads, especially, who opposed the war and wanted to negotiate peace, so they just didn't want the Civil War. So one of them from Ohio was even briefly banished from the United States to the Confederacy for his treasonable pro-Confederacy speeches during the war. He eventually then left to Canada. But of course you can just kind of see that even though many people supported it, there was also opposition, even within the Northern Sphere. So the election of 1864 was another crucial election. So the Democrats, for them, they picked the popular General George McClellan. You may remember him from like Antietam and getting fired by Lincoln. So this time he actually ran against Lincoln. And basically he won a few states like Kentucky, New Jersey, Connecticut, Delaware, but the vast majority once again went to Lincoln. Of course the South didn't vote as well. And basically McClellan's platform was like calling for peace and it was kind of like the Copperheads. They really appealed to millions of war wary voters. But the Republicans themselves had another plan. So they renamed themselves temporarily to the Unionist Party to attract the votes of the War Democrats or people who still wanted to finish out the war. And this really didn't help the Democratic cause, and a brief like ditch Lincoln campaign didn't work out either. And ultimately, the Republicans also chose a loyal war Democrat from Tennessee, Senator Andrew Johnson, as his running mate to sort of appease more Democrats into voting Republican. So this was a good tactic, and Lincoln won 212 to the Democrats 21. But McClellan was still very popular, with gaining a 45% of the total votes cast in the popular election. So basically throughout this war, the South played on cotton diplomacy. So they basically bet that like King Cotton would have the power to dictate another nation's foreign policy. And it would sort of force Europe like Britain and France to come in because they needed the cotton for their textile industries. But Europe quickly found other ways sort of proving that King Cotton was not really king. And these sources came from other places, for example, Egypt and India. Also, there were new cloth industries such as woolen and linen that were also growing as well. So cotton diplomacy ultimately didn't work for the South and they couldn't get the support they needed. Late in the game, the Union officers finally started racking up some wins. So one of them was in Vicksburg and this was 1863. And basically General Grant, who had, General Ulysses S. Grant, who would later become president, started marching down the Mississippi and eventually he captured all that surrounding land. And at the end, he wanted to defeat the heavily fortified city of Vicksburg, Mississippi, as you can see in the map. And he bombed and his troops, they bombed Vicksburg for seven weeks and the Confederates finally surrendered on the very patriotic July 4th. And with this, federal warships now controlled the full length of the Mississippi. And with that, they achieved one of their goals as the early Union strategy to split the Confederacy. So Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana were now cut from the rest of the Confederacy. And this was really great for the Union. but. There was another important battle in the East, and basically Lee decided to go on the offensive again, much like he did at Antietam. And basically, he went to enemy territory again, and he wanted to win Maryland again, and Pennsylvania. So he wanted to destroy the Union Army, or basically capture a major northern city, so there would be probably a peace treaty that the North would call. And this would help really probably gain foreign intervention for the Confederacy as well. So like that cotton diplomacy and support from other countries like Britain. And so basically on July 1st, 1863, there's also 1863, the Confederates, they surprised Union units at Gettysburg, so that's Southern Pennsylvania, and they had the most crucial of the war, most crucial battle of the war, and also the bloodiest with 50,000 casualties. And this was a very crazy battle. So Lee assaulted the Union lines until the second and third days, and even an unsuccessful charge by a Confederate officer proved futile, and eventually the Confederate army was destroyed and they had to retreat really badly back to Virginia. So down in the South, Grant had been promoted the main general of the Union, and one of his best veterans was General William Tecumseh Sherman. So Sherman was best known for leading a force of 100,000 men, and he basically set out from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and it was a campaign of deliberate destruction, and it went across the whole state of Georgia and basically went even north into South Carolina. And he was a pioneer of the tactics of total war, so basically being ruthless. He destroyed everything in his path, burning cotton fields, barns, and houses, basically anything the Confederacy might still use to survive. And ultimately, he took Atlanta first in 1864, so that's right here, and marched all the way down to the important port city of Savannah before advancing north into South Carolina. And by this time, this was a crucial time because it was 1864, and with the election, it really helped Lincoln. And eventually, he completed his campaign by 1865, effectively ending the big southern front of the war as well. So this really destroyed the spirit of the Confederacy and destroyed 
the Confederates willing to fight on. Ultimately, the Union leader met with the Confederate leader. So Grant met Lee at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, and they surrendered. The Confederates sur surrendered on April 9th, 1865, effectively ending the war. But this was also, as said before, the most costly war in the history of the United States and also the most devastating. And then, however, not only slaves got their freedom that they needed, but they also got many rights that were not guaranteed to them before. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one when we continue the story of America.